Welcome to the latest edition of Access All Areas Backstage Podcast. I'm delighted to be here today with Jill T, the co-founder of Black Beer Festival. It takes place every year here in Erich Park, a 3,500 acre site, which is one of the oldest deer parks in England. Jill, you've had a long and successful history in the live entertainment industry, Um, but (laughs) it's not too big a question. How did you get from being a sort of teenaged um, dental nurse (laughs) to to where we are now, really, which is actually just, you know, one of the most beautiful settings I can think of for a festival to take place? Um, And, um, you know, we've, we've, you know, at the top of your game as a a promoter, really, in uh, the festival industry. Ah. It's a big question. Interesting. <laughs> how, long have, how long have you got? It's a long time. About 40 minutes. <laughs> so uh, the, the quick version is that I was a dental nurse and then um, I got married when I was 18, had a, uh, my first child when I was 20 and started a business with my husband then, which was in the building industry. I used to do all the paperwork, all the backstage stuff, of <laughs> call it backstage, um, of... Uh, accounting and dealing with banks and all of that. Then uh, when my children were a little bit older, I suddenly got bored with um, having that as my secondary part of my life, the business. I love being a mum. That was my you know, absolute joy um, of being a mum. But I thought for two days a week, I might be able to do something different. Uh, so I got out the yellow pages. That's how old I am, yellow pages. <laughs> And look for, I wanted to work in Covent Garden, for, but for two days a week. So I went through the Yellow Pages, found all businesses that I thought that I might like to work at. One of them actually was Harvey Goldsmith's office, funnily enough. And um, I wrote a letter. I just wrote a letter saying, hi, my name's Jill. You know, I've got two young children. I want to work two days a week and uh, I want to work in the Covent Garden area. I will work a month free of charge. Uh, and added to which I make a lovely cup of tea. I sent out, I sent this nutty letter out to about thirty people, um, and I got massive response back. Actually, from Harvey's office, a really lovely one back. Um, and within two days, I was having an interview in the Duke of York Theatre, St Martin's Lane, that was looking for a part-time bookkeeper because that was where my experience had been. Um, I then. Uh, I, I went for this interview, unbeknown to me, the theatre was owned by Capital Radio uh, and they gave me the job two days a week as a bookkeeper but very quickly I didn't, I hardly did any bookkeeping. I became the new general manager's assistant and uh, then Capital asked me to start getting involved with the promoters in the UK to promote their stuff on air at Capital um, and it just my, my career built through Capital. They sold the theatre. Richard Attenborough was the uh, chairman at the time they, of, of Capital and the Duke York Theatre. They sold the theatre and asked me to go up to Capital Radio and start working there, which I did. I was the only part-timer that was there for, for a period of time. And then through personal circumstances, I had to start earning more money and I had an opportunity at Capital to build a career. And so that's kind of where I started my music career was at Capital Radio. And you were at Capital for, um, I think you were head of music there? Uh, head, of entertainment. head of entertainment. I ended up becoming <laughs> yeah. head of entertainment. I didn't pop in just as a head of entertainment. So I built my career there yeah. and yeah, I eventually became head of entertainment. And Party in the Park was my project, my, my, my baby. Um, in Hyde Park so yeah the first ever party in the park was under my one under my care. I've done quite a few interviews in my time but this has got to be one of the most beautiful locations to, to do an interview. Um, <laughs> I, thought you I, thought, I thought you used to say one of the most interesting people. Well obviously <laughs> goes without saying but you've been working in one form or another with this site for what 20 years it's not just the it's not just since 2018 when you set up black there so can you kind of just talk us through a little bit about your sort of ongoing relationship with the family that own this estate and um why you've been kind of um bringing events into this space for for two decades well 
I haven't actually been bringing events in 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 at the beginning. I came to look at it as a pos- potential festival site for somebody else, um, but I obviously fell in love with the whole surroundings here. How could you not? It's wild. It's beautiful. Um, the lord and lady who own the estate, along with John B, the estate manager, could not have been more welcoming to me, and embraced me into the family. <laughs> Uh, on the estate and and we've sort of grown together in um i then become a consultant to the estate they asked me to get involved with them help them with getting bigger licenses for them and generally overseeing anything that came onto the estate um that that was a was an event and bringing my expertise to the table yeah i mean so in terms of black deer in terms of you know the americana what led you to kind of decide to launch a festival, really, that's kind of targeted at that market and that genre. Well, Americana has always been a massive, massive part of my life. You know, when I was young, I grew up to that bit. That music was played all the time. My brother was a budding musician. He and his friends used to come and play all of the old classics. And, you know, they were a band. Um, and it was like the most wonderful music. But I, as I say, I know words to things. <laughs> you kind of like what you do when you absorb something when you're really, really young. Um, and then when I was 12, my brother tragically, he was murdered. He died. And it was such an unbelievably tragic time for us that the music kind of stopped. And it, uh, that music will always have a place in my heart. And then if you go on a bit further, you know, I was running the Hop Farm uh, Festival for Vince Power for five years, where the most amazing Americana artists played. You know, you couldn't get more than the Eagles, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, who, who were absolutely phenomenal artists who I used to listen to when I was young. So it was kind of like my love for it was just always there, but got reignited. Um, and then... Uh, fast forward uh, a few years later, um, a chance conversation I was having. I was having a party at my house, and a friend had asked if he could bring, she could bring her uncle who was staying. He was a retired gentleman who'd worked in marketing for years and years and years. Um, and he came to the party, and he and I started chatting. And he um, he was local because we're relatively local to Eridge. And uh, he said, Jill, you know, you did the hop farm, didn't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, would you ever do your own festival? And I just looked at him and I, I said to him, Colin, the only way I would ever, ever put my toe in the water of doing a festival, I said, if it was financed, it was a genre that I believe had growth because I really sincerely believe in a crowded festival marketplace, there was room for a, a sort of genre specific uh, festival. Um, and I said, and it was the most, uh, and it was held at the most amazing place in the world, which was Eridge Estate. So um, he looked at me and he told me his background. His background was he brought um, Budweiser into the UK and Marlborough cigarettes in, in his big marketing agency that he'd built himself. And, um, and then we just talked about that genre of music, my love for hit. For, for it and for his love of that music because he used to go out to America all the time and you know he loved country music pure country music I loved the Americana country roots music and uh, and we just had this amazing conversation with each other and then uh, like a couple of hours later he sort of said to me chill he said uh, if I was interested in putting some seed money in <laughs> Would you consider investigating the, the opportunity in the UK further? So I didn't hesitate. <laughs> I just went, bearing in mind I vowed I wasn't really going to get involved in any festivals. Uh, I just went to him, yes. <laughs> so um, so that was it. Uh, you know, I called Debs the next day and I said to Debs, Debs, I've got this opportunity that I'm going for to look at how we can... Um, potentially have a have a festival um of americana and deb's loved um americana music and we was working together at that point um and she said oh right okay yeah i think i'm in for that so what we did then um we contacted and started to research it and then within four weeks i think with four or five weeks myself deb's and colin um colin lloyd who's our first ever investor 
was on our way to Nashville with an, an amazing guy called Ian Snodgrass, who'd worked with Universal, who absolutely knew the whole... Um, his black book in Nashville was unbelievable. So before we knew where we were, we were sitting in on big, book, big board tables in Nashville with the top agencies and artist management companies talking about a festival that I planned to do in the UK um, uh, with the Americana sort of uh, genre. And what was great, my calling card of having the Hop Farm five years being the festival director for that really opened some doors for us because uh, a lot of their artists had played at the Hop Farm, you know, with Vince, you know, as the promoter. So it was it was kind of, you know, with Ian backing us, obviously, having faith in us. And I wanted to go in with high production values. I, I, I didn't want to start a festival. I didn't think there was time to start a festival of, a, of that genre um, from Roots Up. I felt like I needed to apply all the experience that I'd gained over the years to take it into that level, you know, uh, and go in with a bang. Because I felt that, that before long... Yeah, other people would realise how important this genre is and, and actually do something about it. So that's kind of how it starts with. Were you always sure that, because I'm mean, obviously rural Kemp in a heritage estate, <laughs> it's quite a long way from Nashville. Um, you, you know, you've obviously got experience in festivals, you obviously knew what you were doing, but uh, yeah, how, you know, were you absolutely confident going into it that there would be the the sort of fan base, if you like, for want of a better way of putting it, that would kind of descend on Kent and this is the right sort of location for it? it it's such a difficult... For me, it was... It, all, all the stars were aligned. It needed to be here. It needed to be somewhere that actually was different to a lot of other venues. You know, this is, an, uh, I mean, as you can see, an absolutely stunning environment. But not only is it a stunning environment, there's something magical about it that goes like that. You know, it really is. It really, it really does that to you. So for me, the only place it could be was Erridge. And Kent, because of my experience, and I live in the Kent uh, County with the Hot Farm, I knew there was an audience uh, for, for a certain type of festival here. So it was kind of, you know, rightly or wrongly, I, I was determined that it needed to have those component parts, you know. And I believe that Ken, you know, you, you're talking... 40 minutes from London, you know, to get to Tunbridge Wells, 45 minutes to get to Tunbridge Wells. You know, it's a great train service that goes into Charing Cross, London Bridge, the city. You can easily access it. But also, we're, at, you know, we're near Brighton, Hastings and all the surrounding areas of, of this beautiful estate. And it was about tapping into the love of this music um, for the people that actually knew what Americana was and what this genre was initially. So Debs and I, you know, we worked tirelessly, you know, we, we sacrificed a lot, actually, to um, to build the community prior to the festival happening. Um, you know, we, we, you know um, there, there's an organisation called the Americana UK, which is lives and breathes this music. Um, and also you've got some great festivals already happening. It's just they're not in the they're not so well known. Um, so it's tapping into all of that amazing resource and bringing it all together and starting something you really believed in. You know, I, I really believed from every part of me that this was the right thing to do. And you've obviously got, you know, powerful um, corporations like AG, Live Nation, Superstruct, really, you know, with, with, with strong um, positions in the market. Were there any concerns at all that you were kind of going into to, into a marketplace that had such kind of powerful players in it? Um, you know, going into a market was it? I think it started three uh, three thousand capacity. Is that right, Black Deer? Yeah, I think the first year was about we got about three and a half, four thousand people in. Sure. So I mean, obviously, it might have been even more than that. You, you obviously were confident, but the question, I guess, is were there any concerns around the sort of longevity of being able to kind of get you know of the event and being able to get something off the ground and grow it when the marketplace is. <laughs> so many strong players in it i was so some would say bloody minded about it um but what was amazing we you can't put a festival like this on without it costing money so we had to get other investors believing in the passion and believing what was possible uh to, to get the ball rolling we've had some amazing supporters of the festival over the years um 
yeah, I had to believe in it. There wasn't any part of me. I've never been scared of a battle. <laughs> And, you know, and also, like, I know most of the guys in AG, like, Live Nation, who are at the top of the, you know, the tree. And and I, I actually think within the industry, there was almost a respect that, that we'd gone out on a limb, on a genre that everyone was thinking, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, like, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, we thought that sometimes too, <laughs> When Debs and I were up up till you know all hours, you know it was twenty four hours a day. Not exactly twenty four, but it was like it took it consumed our lives and consumed our families' lives, you know, and extended families. You know, everyone involved in our festival. There's a massive like feeling of loyalty to us, and I think because obviously people that knew my history in the hop farm knew that I'd um, you know that went bust, and I lost you know, personally, a, a chunk of money out of that, you know. But I call it my um, my most expensive education. Because <laughs> I, I learned so much off of Vince. I, I never take anything away from that. The, the, he gave me a chance. And we're talking like when we started, that was 2008, um, to be in charge of a his baby, which was the hop farm, um, and and... You know, I know people talk about, you know, women and how difficult it all is to be a woman in any position of, of control. But he tr entrusted me with that. And we, I, again, I worked tirelessly for him as the festival director and gave it my all. So my family are used to me going hot farm. You know, passion was, you know, building this thing with Vince and giving it my all and then fingers got burnt never going to touch a festival again <laughs> see your festivals and go and do other things obviously in the entertainment industry and in the uh, music industry but I'm not going to do a festival so this chance conversation with Colin Lloyd um, was just like a weird suddenly it went like that suddenly I knew something in my whole heart and being told me this was right and my determination I believe um, has carried us through uh, you know I, I, I our investors probably wish they never saw me. <laughs> Quite a few things I wanted to kind of go back and touch on there. But I mean, Hot Farm, just for one thing. I mean, obviously it was challenging and it ended and it was difficult when it ended. But, um, you know, he, you guys brought some amazing artists into that site. You know, Prince, um, Bob Dylan, uh, Neil Young. Just wondering if there's any kind of... What's the first sort of highlight of that period uh, of putting that event on and working with Vince to put that event on? What, what's the kind of first amusing, fun... Oh, what a great sort of memory that you have of that time. I've got, I've got so obviously so many memories. One of them that stands out to me um, <laughs> massively is I was told you I used to listen to music when I was a kid, and Neil Young was 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 an incredible artist. So there he was, you know, somebody that I'd listened to for years playing at the Hot Farm, you know, headlining the Hot Farm. So uh, he came on site with his entourage and you know they they were, they were all sort of you know in their backstage area and then all of a sudden his manager come up to me and said Jill he said uh, uh is there any chance of Neil having a private shower in here because obviously you're bringing you're bringing everything on site and you've got the showers for for the whole of the um artist backstage area and I went oh, I'm really sorry we haven't got any other shower facilities but then something clicked in my head that we were on the hop farm and I said, look, what I'll do is I'll speak to the owner of the hop farm and see if there's anything that we could utilise that's on the hop farm. <laughs> so so, so um, I've, got, I've, I've spoken to them. They said, Jill, the only thing we've got is where, where the workers shower. He said, so it's a room, like it's got up three flights of stairs. It's a shower, but I don't know what state it's in. So I went, right, OK, look, I'll put that to them and see if that's going to be viable. So anyway, the manager come up to me and said, do you any luck? I said, right, there's only one place. And bearing in mind, I'm in charge. Like, I, I was busy, busy, busy. You know, like I was a festival director. being put. I went, the, the only place there is, I said, is a worker's place that you can have a shower. Anyway, he said, OK, I'll ask Neil. <laughs> he come back. And he went, Jill, he said, Neil would like to take you up on that offer. He said, but you, we want you to come with us. So I'm thinking, What? So anyway, I thought, if it's Neil Young, I'm going to do it. So uh, so I found myself with Neil Young in the bucket. Bearing in mind, I hadn't looked at the the um, 
the, the facilities. I was just told, I was given a key, I didn't have time to check it out. It was all happened just as quickly almost as I'm saying it. I'm sitting on my buggy with Neil Young beside me with a pile of towels on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> Taking you off for a walk. This is like, okay, okay, Neil, hold those. So it's me and Neil Young, <laughs> a pile of towels on his lap. And then the manager sitting behind in the buggy, I've pulled up, gone into the flat. <laughs> oh my God. You could smell men had been in there with, you know, not showering immediately. But it's all So I've gone up the first flight of stairs. <laughs> me and Neil Young and his manager. Looked over to one side in a room and there's old beer cans and old socks and things laying around. Gone up to the top where the shower is and it's like on the top floor. Well, I don't think it had been used for obviously a few weeks or a couple of weeks or whatever. So there is me, I'm in there turning the shower on and do you know when it splatters? Like, like really yeah. splatters. <laughs> and then I've gone, there you go, Neil. Neil has gone into this tatty old shower. <laughs> And I said, if you need if you need your back scrub, give us a shout. And I, honestly, that man, he came out and he said, thank you so much, Jill. And it was just like lovely. And then, then what he did is he went on to ask me about the history of the hop farm. He was really, really interested. So we spent about 10 minutes together just talking about, you know, what is the hop farm and how it came about and all of that. And so, do you know when you meet somebody who you really believe is like iconic hero? And there are, uh, he was so lovely, so charming and so humble, actually. And uh, yeah, that was my, uh, that was my funny story. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> um, so, I mean, Black Deer started, as, as I keep sort of saying, 2018. I mean, brought about 4,000 people in, you know, it was bigger the next year. I can't remember exactly what size you got to the next year. Seven, eight thousand. Seven, which yeah. is you know pretty much doubling. So that's yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, you were really, year, yeah. so you were gathering a really good momentum, and then a slightly irritating COVID nineteen <laughs> uh, <laughs> popped in um, to paralyze everybody. But um, so I mean, obviously that was difficult for absolutely everybody, and I don't want to linger on it too much because I'd rather forget about the whole. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone would rather forget about it. But it, it, for for a festival at that stage that had literally only been around for two years, well, I mean, how concerned were you? I mean, I guess at that point you'd got that relationship with the audience and the ticket buyers and, yeah. you know, the support behind it and, and the team, you know, really focused on it. But but how concerning and, and difficult was that period? Oh, massive. I mean, obviously you've got shareholders' money that you've taken, you've got customers who, who who really wanted to come to the festival so you had sitting in the in the bank account was a uh, ticket money that people had bought tickets early bird tickets for the following year you had so much uncertainty around um and then chris russell fish is our md he kind of took charge of managing that process with our shareholders and with us you know as a team debs and i and um we edged through it is all I can say with with luck, with his care to to ensure that we 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 opened again in what was hoping would be the following year. You know, we knew that we wouldn't be able to open in twenty. Uh, our, we were so lucky. Our, our retention of uh, ticket buyers who wanted to stick with us. I think it was. I, th I think we were told it it was the second highest retention for a new festival that was incredible and we're talking you know a couple of thousand tickets it wasn't you know tiny amount so it was just painful 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 we'd have a weekly call what we're going to do how we're going to manage this you know our shareholders everybody got on board to try to work it through but, but it, you know I can't pretend it was not a massive strain on everybody it was and it was yeah it was heartbreaking heartbreaking so the first event back must have been quite a release quite a moment we had a full start didn't we i don't know if you you probably wouldn't recall this but we was um going to be the first festival that opened in 2021 of course. yeah yeah i do yeah yeah so we were told that you know the the, the so obviously we missed 20 2021 we was just outside of the curfew by i think it was a couple of weeks or a month or something. I can't, I can't, I can't remember. A couple of weeks. But you didn't. We there was no, no not much notice at all of when that was actually going to start, was there? So no, but you... we made we made a, a, a conscious choice with all the shareholders and the board to to go for it. To go for twenty one. Be the first out of the block after COVID. 
it could have been the most amazing thing ever. Um, and, you know, in terms of publicity, we got loads of publicity. Foreign Debs and over on BBC News and all kinds of things. Probably because people thought we were nuts, but it was... Didn't you get brought up in, in Parliament, <laughs> Parliament as well? Parliament, I mean, yeah. yeah. It, we was talked about in Parliament um, and it, it was just crazy time because people just got excited about the thought that this little festival of a genre that wasn't really mainstream was getting so much publicity on the back of we was giving it another go. Um, and and we was going to be brave enough to 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 be that first one out, so we um, started to build the site, and it, at, uh, Black Deer at that point couldn't have been more COVID safe. It was just you know we'd we'd jump through all the hoops, we'd done every single possible thing, we'd, tickets were selling well, and we was going to open our gates. So I I'm always on site from day one right the way through to till it ends because that's my passion. I love. I love all the people, you know, we build an excitement together and I've got, you know, I've known a lot of these suppliers for years and our teams, everyone's on there. You couldn't have got a more excited time. We was on there for, it was the first week, a uh, week and a couple of days. And every time a supplier arrived, there was all bibbing and woo, woo, woo. It was just like, honestly, the most incredible time. Uh, for me to watch that was was just like, oh, my God. Every night we'd have a campfire and people would be singing around the campfire, a few beers. And, and you know, every every day it built, you know, uh, new suppliers come on board and the excitement was huge. Well, then ITV, um, Boris was going to make a decision whether he was going to extend the, um, the, the closing down of, of everything for another four weeks. And so we was on site thinking, oh, my God. Is that going to happen? Is he going to extend that curfew until, until another four weeks? And that momentum started to build again. And then ITV, I think it was ITV, wanted to do an interview when we got the decision with me at, on the estate. Yeah. So, you know, everyone's going, no, he can't do that. He can't, he's going to, you know, he's, he's, he's not going to do this. He's not going to do this. It's going to be fine. We're going to be fine. So I'm kind of like a little, obviously a little bit apprehensive because I'm thinking, oh, surely he can't. And every we talked ourselves into the fact that he couldn't do it. <laughs> and then uh, we we was there. They were filming my reaction, <laughs> um, which was a little bit worrying because if I'd if we if it had been a positive one, I'd have been whoop, whooping and shaking them all up. So it would. <laughs> But unfortunately, it was a negative one, and he decided to extend it for four weeks, which meant that all of our amazing suppliers, all of our amazing team, it just went into this quiet. It was almost like somebody had passed away. Everyone had their heads down. Everyone was looking at me so sympathetically. And it was it was really, really, really sad. Um, but we took that gamble. You know, so many things could have gone wrong. We took the gamble. Had it been you know, a positive, we would have been the first one out of the block and it would have been an incredible um, experience, but it wasn't to be. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of money had been paid out on all the infrastructure and suppliers at that point. So uh, we lost a hell of a lot of money out of that, um, which was a terrible, terrible shame, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's been, I don't want to linger on the negative for really, anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you don't do negative. <laughs> it felt difficult even bringing up the pandemic period, to be quite honest. But obviously, on the after that, you know, the whole industry has been coping. Well, actually, society has been coping with a, you know, the cost of living crisis and just soaring inflation and costing. You know, obviously, the cost of materials has gone through the roof, and Brexit hasn't exactly helped matters. Um, and then, obviously, during the pandemic, a lot of people sort of moved. A lot of workers moved out of the industry um, across various different sort of skill sets, I guess. Um, so. You know, you've kind of pressed ahead and you've got the festival back and it's continuing to grow and it's and uh, you've also got that loyal fan base, but it can't have been particularly easy even after, you know, the pandemic was finished with, with rising costs. Yeah. So how, how have you kind of balanced things? Have you made that kind of I mean, I, 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 in my other life was Entity Hire, a fe, a fe, a, a fe, um, sorry, a business I started with my son, which is, you know, a successful fencing supply business, where I learned about supply. I think a lot of promoters or, you know, production, d d um, sorry, promoters essentially don't really understand what happens further down the, 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 the line. Um, and suppliers were being accused of, 
you know, profiteering and all of that, which couldn't have been further from the truth. Yeah. You know, I knew this industry, I know it through through all the different parts of it, you know, and obviously some people were profiteering and making money, but a lot of them did their utmost to be loyal to, the, to their festivals that they worked on. Um, and through loyalty, I think, through extreme loyalty of, um, like Joe from NW Live, who manages all our production, um, he really um, held his suppliers um, in the palm of their, his hands to say, you know, come on, guys, let's help this festival. <laughs> and I think everybody just had such a good will towards Black Deer that they tried their best to do as much as they could and keep the prices as good as they could, you know. Um, but unfortunately, it is a fact of life that no matter how much loyalty uh, you've got, things cost a certain amount of money. So... You know, it did it did hit us hard, uh, the fact that we had to um, support or get other investors in to support the belief in the festival to see it through again and, and, and help it financially uh, to, to, to see the light of day for the following year. Yeah. So, you know, ours was through a belief from our um, investors that actually there was a future in Black Deer and the brand because we set out to build a brand that could be not just a festival, the offshoots of that could be um, amazing. Um, and so I think it was sheer belief from a lot of people that we could continue that, that helped subsidise that. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, hopefully Black Deer will be a massive... Oops, my hat. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on to your hat. <laughs> a, a massive success in the future. I mean, you know, it, I'd, I'd be lying if i said to you that it, it it's guaranteed <laughs> in this festival marketplace that you know give it another couple of years under its belt and it's going to be a phenomenal financial success <laughs> i mean you know we're all realistic to, enough to know and experienced enough to know that it could not be that but i feel with the estate with the genre with the positivity around it that we do set ourselves as a you know, our ethos, I know everyone's got their own ethos, but there is something special about Black Deer. You know, people feel it when they come in the gate. It is, it is you know, it's their festival. And I think if that carries us through with the love for it, if that carries us through to be a success in the future, then, um, you know, then that would be the case. And I'll be so super proud to have, to have been part of that journey, you know, of being having something that burns away at you and, you know, and Debs, we gave, as I say, we gave so much to it over the years and it's just not been easy. It hasn't been easy, even though I'm really positive about everything. <laughs> but your community must have stuck with you in the sense that, you know, you, you know, it's, it's, it's continued to expand and grow. I mean, I, I believe you've got something like a room to, I mean, obviously it's something 3,500 acres. You've got plenty of room, but the license I understand is, I think, in fact, a license wasn't that based on um, thirty thousand, which was basically when they last had a festival here. I believe it was eighteen eighty <laughs> for thirty thousand people turning up on train and horse and wagons and whatever they turned up that, on. That's, that's actually very, very feet. true. There was a festival here held here, actually in the, in the fields behind in the fields I call it in the acres behind, um, which was in eighteen. I think it was eighteen eighty. Was it eighteen eighty? Eighteen sixty? Eighteen eighty? which was a 30,000 capacity uh, gathering. I think it was a political gathering that had music and food and all of the elements we have at Black Deer. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the number that was plugged out <laughs> as a number to get the artist uh, uh, license for. So, sorry, the, the capacity license for. Would you want to hit that number or do you feel that the, you know, the, there's a right kind of comfort area? I, I feel our of... sweet spot for for is 20,000. You know, we can facilitate 20,000 a day. We've got the license for 30 and we've got enough ground that we can expand. But I think you, I think there's something special about a festival around about that 20, you know, maybe 2022 20, mark. We, where we've got enough space that we can ext extend our, you know, uh, fence lines out to still have that feeling that all age groups can come here and you can ha uh, have a sense of freedom if you wanted to sit away from the, 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 the hustle bustle of the festival, you can still do that. So I think that that kind of number for me feels right. 
Um, financially, again, for the future for our investors, whether that is the number that they would be happy with is, is, is another question. Really. I just wanted to, to sort of reverse that because obviously there's the tragedy of your brother and he was a musician. He loved this music. You love this music as you grew up. It's, you put your heart and soul into this event. Mm-hmm. which obviously apart from all the money and apart from everything else and the expertise that you've gained over the years is obviously part of the reason why it's been successful and embraced by people who, who kind of love the genre. I guess the point I'm kind of getting to is when it comes to making an event successful, it has to be so much more than just the headliners that bring the punters in, you know. So what would you say that it is about the event and, and um, you know, the different areas and the different spaces and the different sort of entertainment on offer, if you like, um, that... that it, that creates the atmosphere that that brings people in here and that that, you know creates that experience that's so appealing i totally agree with you i think a festival now is more than the headliners far more than the headliners um bev burton who is our you know who's our booker for black deer she she's done a phenomenal job of bringing in a mixed you know that that whole americana mix of artists and and bringing some good sort of headliners within our budget um but my passion um, is, is building the periphery areas of a festival. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, as with Debs, you know, we look, we looked at more of the detail. Debs, Debs is um, uh, and her team on the marketing. Debs is the marketing director, so it's about the brand externally. Um, but also, obviously, Debs, we, we, you know, got involved with planning and curating the festival. So each part of the festival. It's special. Mm. <laughs> I know everyone thinks that, but of their own festival, but it really is. So take Haley's Bar. Haley's Bar is a venue that we built, and my brother Chris Haley um, is dedicated to him. Yeah. And on the walls of uh, the venue is this most iconic picture of my brother with his mates all playing musical instruments. So. And, and the storytelling that Debs and her team do on our um, website, on, you know, had done on our website, was was that story. And so some people had not read that and didn't realise. Some people come and are totally oblivious to it. But I think it's it's that kind of thing that that actually touches people's hearts and makes them feel more engaged. Yeah. So then you 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 know you walk around. We created a young folk area where Alice Berry, who worked with me for years and years and years. She um, she was curating that, so that was almost a little festival on, on its own. So what we didn't want to just do something for the kids that wasn't very, um, you know, that was just an add-on. We wanted to create an environment that if you went there in isolation, you would have you and your children would have the most amazing time. So that's young folk. Then we did Roadhouse. So Roadhouse is another world on its own. So um, you know that was curated by my son has got. Um, um, a brand called a festival called Desert Fest, so it's down and heavy. It's desert blues. It's more sort of stoner rock music. So it's got a, a, a different identity to the other music that's playing around the site. So we've got motorbikes, custom cars. People hang out at the roadhouse. They've got tattoos. People hang out at the roadhouse the whole time. So what you've got is you've got a, another place that could grow in its own right. Mm. So, um, and then. Uh, the amazing, incredible um, uh, John Finch and Ben Merriton, who used to run Grillstock, they started Grillstock, which was a fest- really successful food-based festival. They come, Debs and I met with them and asked them if they wanted to get involved with Black Deer, and they come and they curated that area for us. So that is, Live Fire is all about low and slow cooking, the best barbecue cooking you can get. And it's become a, an almost like iconic place. We have the chili eating competition, hot dog eating competition, music you know um that that it's not predominantly music but you know a band goes and plays on there that's sort of relevant to that audience um and we have the most incredible gospel brunch that plays there so on sunday that's like having a drink without having a drink <laughs> <laughs> it's the most incredible atmosphere yeah so there's food and you know this year we've got cafe nero uh, um become involved with us this year and Cafe Nero, I've known Pablo, who started Cafe Nero years and years ago, and he rang and said, Jill, like, we're not doing cornbread. He asked me when we first started Black Deer, wouldn't it be lovely if we did a Cafe Nero at, at Black Deer the same way as we do cornbread? Then when cornbread finished, we wasn't in a position then to sort of do that. Um, they came on board um, and they was going to bring, you know, this is no offence to Cafe Nero's uh, <laughs> 
artistic artistic sort of license but they were going to bring a big white marquee a big clear marquee right in the middle of my beautiful site yeah and i just went no way guys i'm really really sorry if you're going to be part of black deer you've got to be part of black deer mm. and that means creating something beautiful mm. you know that goes in with this this amazing in scene um and they went okay okay we'll take it on board so they went away and they could not have done a better job so when they arrived this year on site you know again i'm here so i'm helping place things making sure they've got the right um they put together this most incredible venue and people came and people loved it because our audience is all age groups so what you've got is like this 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 amazing um uh place for them to belong but one of the sorry i know i'm chatterboxing but <laughs> one of the most special places that touches my heart so much um is super jam yeah so super jam i was a mentor for the kids that like, way before i um uh, started black deer and super jam is for kids that have fallen through the education system and these two guys um who started it david court and nick steelwell were really really successful businessmen and, and in films and everything and uh, i met them and they started this college with just six students to help these kids um feel good about themselves but the core uh, being was about music so it was all about music so i used to go and talk to the kids because obviously what happened to me as a young person could have changed my world because it did shatter for quite a few years but it could have changed my world forever so i talked to them about how i you know overcome certain you know obstacles that were there in my heart um and ended up having a really successful career that I've really enjoyed. So that was that was how I sort of got involved with them. So when I started, um, by the time I started Black Deer, there was an amazing college in Swanley that then had, I think it was about 60 students and one Ofsted rated as good. It was being um, government backed. So it had turned from these six kids into a, an, a, an amazing college where kids were going to university. And I went, I rang David, I went, David, I'm going to do my own festival and Super Jam, I've got to be part of it. <laughs> so that's how the Super Jam stage started at Black Deer. And every year, the students, we do workshops, we go down to the, the um, colleges, which is now three colleges. There's one in Brighton, one in Canterbury, and the, and the original one in Swanley. And the kids get involved. We, Black Deer's on their curriculum. So that, that's how we are, you know, that, that's the festival. So that's what I'm saying. Every part of that festival has a has like a, a story and a realness about it that it's about more than just the artist the artists are you know obviously massive and, and a core of everything of every part of that festival but it's about feeling it's about it's about the loyalty that our, once people come through the gates they want to come back and they want to bring their friends with them and that's such an amazing feeling for, for us yeah, I mean, it's all about, you know, creating that environment, that special environment for people that they can identify with and they can escape from the outside world within, if you like, you know. But that story you mentioned earlier on about the brooch that you're wearing with that lovely silver deer that you're wearing there, I mean, I think that's a, a really nice story, if you don't mind bringing it, recounting it for this podcast. But, you know, I think that just, you know, sums it up in terms of what festivals can do for people. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes you, you don't always realize the impact you have on the individuals who do come and what their moments are in their life at that time and um this was 2019 and you know the pressures of putting the festival on and i'm I, you know my my thing is production so i you know deb's is the outside world also but but mine is the making sure that everything runs smoothly so it was like Sunday afternoon and I'm thinking, oh my God, like I was so happy that everything got well and everyone was happy. So I was like, oh yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm trying along on my own, <laughs> walking around, the, walking up, up, up a hill, up one of the hill bits. And this, I saw this man coming towards me and he said, Jill, I hope you don't mind me stopping you. He said, but I, I wanted to give you a gift. And um I said, oh, like, oh, thank you. And I recognised him because we've got an attendees um, uh, Facebook community and I recognised him and I said, I know who you are. And uh, anyway, oh, Jew, he said, like, you know, he said, please let me get you something. I've, I've been waiting for the opportunity all day. And I opened up this thing and it was this deer, little silver deer. 
And he said, I just want you to know you have no idea, idea how black dear, black dear, um, changed my life. He said, I was, I, he said, I won't go into the detail, but I was in an incredible bad place mm. in my life. Mm. He said, and then he saw, or somebody rang him and said, look, he loves Americana music and said, look, this, this festival's open in 2018. Why don't you come along? And he came along and he said that it, it was just, it was life changing for him because he met a community of people and felt so, so special here in this environment. Yeah. And that's what I think Eridge is. I think it's, I think it's an environment with the right festival on it. And the, the, the marriage of those two things together, I think is what makes Black Deer. I, I really, with all my heart, I believe that. I believed it when I first wanted it to be here and I, I've never changed my view ever. So one of the things that strikes me, we've got this plenty of really skilled women in the events industry, but when it comes to festival founders, it really just seems to be quite a lack, you know, we're obviously putting this series of um, podcasts together that's you know involving festival founders there are very few women and it's that very it's <laughs> just because you're the only one i could find <laughs> not at all obviously <laughs> but, otherwise it'd have been all bloke <laughs> yeah. no, but honestly um you know it's you went from being, you know, uh, a teenage dental nurse, you were an, a young mum, you got married early, you built a, you know, a really successful career in live events and you're running Black Day, which is a sort of beloved festival for many people. You know, you, you've, you've done it. Why do you not think, why do you think it's so sort of male heavy? You know, why, why have more women set out festivals? It certainly isn't for the faint-hearted and you can't, you, you can't, um, even begin to understand what it takes but when you set out your journey with your passion you don't know you don't know what that really really means yeah. until you're in it yeah. um so I, I think you've got to be a certain character you know i think you have to i think women you know, I, and I, I don't i'm not generalizing at all but i i do think sometimes there's the lack of confidence to do something that's that's always been seen as being almost uh Mal territory, you know, which isn't true. It isn't true. You know, I think um, women in charge of a festival, like Debs and I, have brought our own uh, unique personalities to it. And I think there are so many talented people out there, women who could do it. But you've got to have balls for it. I'm a ballsy person, you know. I'm I'm like a little like. I go, no, that's okay. That's okay. We're going to sort that one out. That'll be okay. And I'm a always optimistic <laughs> which is not always a good thing but uh, but it, it sort of served us relatively well but I'm I, when you've got passion in you I mean I am as passionate now about Black Deer and whatever the future brings with that because there's changes in Black Deer now they've had to happen um so I think for women who feel like I wish I could give it a go I'd go bloody give it a go what have you got to lose mm. What have you got to lose by just... You have to put your head above the parapet, which is not easy for a lot of people. You know, I think you have to be a certain personality um, to, to do that. Years ago, I used to be asked on panels all the time, and I'd go, oh, no, I haven't really got anything much to say. No, no, no. And I, when I was, you know, obviously, I've entities still, you know, entity events is still my business, although it's more of a black deer has consumed me. Um but I used to be asked to do stuff and, oh, Jill, you've done this and you've done that. Come and speak. And I go, oh, no, 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 no. Let's have a shot of Jaeger. Um, no, but, <laughs> but I used to, oh, I'm not really that interested. It's not. And I genuinely didn't feel that I, that I had much to say. And I think it was only when Black Deer became a reality that I thought I've got to be out there. I've got to, to be a figurehead for it and go... This is what we're doing. This is a festival. So I, my courage was always there, but it was always I didn't think I had much to say. And I think that's what it is. I think a lot of women don't always feel that they've got a lot to say yeah. or they've got the confidence to go out on a limb and go, do you know something? I'm going to do this. And I think if they did, if they could just do that one step, um, and be prepared, you know, as I say, I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating any of this. 
<laughs> I'm really not, but I wouldn't change it in in a heartbeat. I I, I absolutely love, with all my heart, the people, the amazing, the amazing people that surround us. Uh, incredible loyalty, and that's like a money can't buy thing. So my experience alone, even if it, if it ended now, I would say I do not regret doing this. Not for one moment. I really, really don't. I've loved every part of it. So I would say to any woman out there, if you've got an idea, run with it. It doesn't have to be a festival, but but you you have to make you have to make it happen. I, I think we are still in a society where no one's hands you anything. You know, you you, you have to earn your spurs. And as a woman in our industry. I do believe, you know, you have to, to to work a little bit harder. And even when you do, it sometimes gets overlooked and dismissed. So you have to prepare yourself for that. But, yeah. you know, give it a go. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's getting better um, for women in this industry. Um, I, hope, I hope to have many more on this podcast series for one thing. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for taking oh, the time to talk to pleasure. us. It's Absolutely. been really enjoyable. Thank Thanks, you. Joe.